Even this verse shows that God is clearly pro-life and clearly interested in confession and absolution. What's up, YouTube? Ryan here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode, I am always contending for the faith, once for all, delivered to the saints. And today we have a weird topic. We're talking about abortion potions in the Bible. Apparently that's a thing. Stick around. <laughs> Context is king, and we need to understand the context under which we're having this conversation. And that is that a few days ago, uh, on a day that the church refers to as the, the observance of the Feast of St. John the Baptizer, you know, the little baby inside of his mother's womb who leapt for joy at the words of Mary because he knew by faith that his Savior was near this John the Baptizer, on that day, that day, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that abortion is not a constitutionally protected right. Therefore, the federal government has no stake in it. Ergo, it goes back to the states. Now, we're not here to have that conversation. We're not here to have any other aspect of that conversation. We are here as Christians, one to another. This is not for the atheists. This is not... For the pro-choicer. This is for pro-life Christians. This is us talking to each other. We're having a conversation about a text out of the book of Numbers that is often used to throw our faith in our face and tell us that we're stupid because even God ordained abortion. I'm not going to read the whole text because brevity is a thing, but I am going to put it up on the side of the screen by the grandfather clock Hey, I got that one right. And you can read it for yourself. But basically, what this text is telling us is that if a man suspects that his wife has been unfaithful, he can bring her to the temple. And there is a ceremony that they can perform to determine her fidelity. Now, under the covenant law of the people of Israel, the... The, uh, the civil law, not the covenant, the, under the civil law of the people of Israel, the consequence for adultery was stoning. But there were no witnesses in this case, so how do we know if the man is jealous or if he's suspicious, I think would be a modern way to say it. He can bring her to the temple and there is a, a ritual under the ceremonial law in the Old Testament. So there's moral, civil, and ceremonial laws. So under this ceremonial law, he can bring a, a grain offering um, and she will hold it in her hands. She will drink holy water mixed with dust from the sanctuary floor, swearing an oath to her fidelity. If she is faithful and truthful in her oath, nothing happens. If she is lying and she has committed adultery on her husband, well then something happens. But what? See, linguistically, this is a problem for us because can the Hebrew word used here mean miscarriage? Yes. Can the word also mean abdominal discomfort? Also, yes. So what do we do? I mean, we could take the simple approach in that most English translations are on the side of abdominal pain. But even if, even if, this potion induced a miscarriage. This is still not an advocation for abortion in the Bible. And we'll get to why. But I think, um, I think it's more of a discomfort. And let me explain why. Context is king. So we have to look at difficult passages through the lens of simple passages. The clear text must interpret the unclear text. And so when we look at verses like, I knit you together in your mother's womb, you are fearfully, wonderfully made. I know the plans that I have for you. I set you apart. I chose you. I called you. The prayers of the psalmist that God was his God in the womb. And especially given that we talked about St. John the Baptist Day, an unborn child leaping for joy by faith because the word had assured him that his Savior was near. 
in that context, the context of life, discomfort. And that's where I stand on the issue. But let's say it's not discomfort. Let's say this water and dust and oath combination induces a miscarriage rather than just abdominal pain and some sort of inner marking on the thigh and future infertility. Let's say it induces a miscarriage. Does that mean God is pro-choice? No. See all the other verses that I had mentioned previously. It's a matter of onus of responsibility. Even if it induced a miscarriage, the purpose from God's perspective of this ceremony was to provide an opportunity for repentance. God's will, remember, God does not delight in the death of the wicked. So God's will is that a woman brought who had committed adultery would confess her sins. Obviously, there are temporal punishments that she would have to face for adultery, but she would spare her life and the life of her unborn child if she were pregnant. And I think this is another point on the side of uh, abdominal discomfort and just some weird mark on the thigh we don't understand. If this test is conducted and the woman was unfaithful, but she wasn't pregnant, then what? What would the sign be? It would have to be abdominal discomfort and a marking on the thighs and future infertility. Only if she were pregnant could we make the case that this is definitively in miscarriage inducing. We can't make that case because it's distinctly possible that an adulterous woman swearing this oath, drinking this water, the oath and the water and the promise of God, it's amazing how many times water and God's word are attached to each other. Eh? Um, but it would induce a reaction in which the priest and her husband would know. So I think that's another point in favor of abdominal discomfort. But the problem with abortion in our society is that the onus is never on the father and the mother both. Now, there are exceptions to the abortion norm that we're not going to address here, but we should talk about them. Ectopic pregnancies, uh, miscarriages, rape, incest, things like these. But these are the statistical outliers to the motive for abortion in the United States. The main reason people have abortions in the United States is because they refuse to take accountability for their actions. Men and women equally refuse to acknowledge that sexual intercourse biologically leads to a human life. And rather than men being men and saying, you know what, I'm not ready to be a father yet, maybe we shouldn't do this. And instead of women embracing their femininity and saying, you know what, I'm not ready to be a mother yet. Maybe we shouldn't do this. They do it anyways because they can escape responsibility for their actions by having an abortion. It's the same in this text. The accountability, the responsibility belongs to the man and the woman who committed adultery, not on God. And God designed this so that the woman would have an opportunity to confess her sins, thus sparing her life and the life of her unborn child if we are to take the miscarriage translation. So this is not about abortion. Even this verse shows that God is clearly pro-life and clearly interested in confession and absolution. That when you repent, you can be forgiven. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So this is not an abortion text. This is a law gospel text is what this is. Water and God's word, which brings a promise and an opportunity for repentance, forgiveness, life and salvation, which is who God is. So until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.